Uh, welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by Greg Larson of Lingo Tech. Now, Greg, like a few of our guests, has segued into sales operations through a background in sales. So hopefully we're going to talk about the necessity, the old question we used to have, the old discussion we used to have about the necessity of sales skills in sales operations. I'm sure we'll get into that. But Greg, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to kick off with that first question about your first kind of how you first got exposed to sales operations and how you took a full-time role in sales operations. Okay. Yeah, so so I got my career started at, at a company called Qualtrics. Uh, you might have heard of them, a research company. And uh, when I was there, I was just in a sales role and we didn't even have a sales ops function. It wasn't very popular at the time. Uh, but we how had many, uh, a how, how many reps were there when you had no sales operation? So when I started, we had a hundred employees. Um, so Qualtrics had just taken their Series A funding, and so we had maybe forty sales reps. Um, cool. And we had just split into territories before. You know, when I first got there, it was just everyone could call on anything, and we had a few uh, industry segments, but not geographic, and so. Uh, about six months in, uh, we one of our uh, basically a marketer, um, Austin Bankhead, started more of a sales ops role, and it was just him. And I was the lucky one that got to test a lot of the processes on the sales side. So me and a couple other guys, we would test the software and the process and the system. And that's when I just fell in love with it. I it was I found out that I had a lot more passion for the operational side of sales than the actual uh, sales, you know, going out, carrying your own bag, you know, going in and, and closing deals. I, I liked that part. And I continued to do that for about 10 years, but I was always interested in the metrics and the dashboards and, and everything that you could tweak to get a little bit more performance out of a team. And so, so kind of, kind of started there. Do we owe a thanks to that sales operations resource for having this interview today then if, if he oh, gave yeah. you your first taste definitely yeah um and you know the, the funny thing is is that you know i i left the company never really got into sales operations at qualtrics but it kind of planted the seed and made me want to uh be more involved in the operational or leadership kind of training up sales reps and doing that more than just being kind of an enterprise sales rep so so yeah, yeah, it so was how, definitely a start. And how long between your first kind of exposure to that, to you taking a full-time sales ops role? It probably would have been about four to five years. So, cool. so from Qualtrics, I, I took a, a sales leadership position at, at another SaaS company, InsideSales.com, um, and work with them through through some high growth times. And then uh, I was introduced to uh, another company that I joined uh, about a year later called Nuvi as a, a social media management company. And uh, going into Nuvi, there were only nine sales reps uh, when I, I had some connections there, some, some colleagues that were already there. And I could tell they, they were going to scale quickly, but they didn't even have a system in place. Salesforce wasn't really in place. There was no training, onboarding, implementation, anything like that. And so I came into that role with the goal, with the CEO straight out to, hey, I want to run the sales enablement, sales operations side of the, of the business and kind of be the one to help you build that. And he said, well, we, you know, th this is kind of what you alluded to. We want to make sure you know what you're doing, right? We want to make sure the person training the sales team and helping them with the process knows how to sell. And so I spent about a year and a half at Nuvi proving that I could sell and, and basically carrying my own bag, selling, uh, helping manage a team, lead a team. And then at that point, we started to grow. We were, we were about 15 to 20 reps and they, they handed over kind of the keys to the, the, the back end of the house to me. So I got to work on onboarding, recruiting and hiring process and and build out the whole sales curriculum how we're going to move from step to step you know how we're going to do ongoing training just kind of everything and 
in the next six months, we scaled from about 20 sales reps to about 65 and grew it and, and just kind of had the system running. And, and that was, that was really fun to kind of cut my teeth with a fast paced company and, and grow so big and have all the process and, and implementation and systems for the sales team kind of in my hands. So Got it. And then if we fast forward to today at Lingotech, can you share just rough numbers of amount of salespeople and amount of people in the ops team? Yeah. So, so Lingotech is, is completely different from, from some of the other companies that I've been at. So it's a software company startup. We do, we do language services and, and language software. So we help companies that need to translate their content and their website into other languages. Um, we are a lot more enterprise than, than other companies. We don't do much small business. And so we have uh, about six, six to eight uh, account executives is all. And all of them are field sales reps. So they're enterprise sales reps that live in, you know, Boston and New York and Chicago, LA, London. And they, they are out there essentially on their own, uh, you know, carrying a territory, managing a territory for themselves. And then I have uh, a team of SDRs that will help feed the, the funnel for them. And then in-house, though, you know, one of those SDRs helps me. But other than that, it's, it's kind of me on the operational side, um, along with, you know, some sales leaders. So, uh, it's, it's a lot different, uh, beast than a 65 man inside sales team. Uh, but it, it pro it, it's kind of brings its own challenges because the people that you're supporting, I, I see them in person maybe five times a year. And so you have to build up a good rapport and provide good systems that, you know, they'll use even when you're not right behind them saying, hey, use this tool or do that or do this. Got it. And to focus on that more, how, especially with this remote relationship, how have you been able to build the, the relationship with the team and then influence sales reps to adopt a new process or tool? Okay. So I, I think the first part was just they, they've got to trust you. And I, th- I feel like that's where the sales background comes in, especially when you don't have that face-to-face time to build rapport. Uh, when you're negotiating a deal or talking through a contract, you know, knowing that, that you have experience as that frontline person helps in your credibility a lot. I don't think it's necessary, but it, it definitely helps build the rapport faster with the sales team. So that was helpful. Uh, and then just the biggest thing is over communicate when you, when you're not, when you're not in the office and you can't just have a kind of a one-on-one conversation, you know, between phone calls or anything like that, then they, I found those sales reps can feel alone sometimes. Uh, you know, we try to pair them in teams so they have some communication with other sales reps, but, but really if they don't hear from you for two weeks, because, you know, everything's running smoothly, you, you still lose some of that credibility. So, you know, not just bugging them, but reaching out with ideas and pinging them for questions, you know, hey, what are you seeing? What can we change? What's working well? Just constantly in communication. And that way, you know, that they know you're there and they know that you know that they're there, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, that they're not just on an island. Got it. Um, and can you quickly share the, the core sales tech stack you have at Lingo Tech? Yeah, so... Because of the remote nature of a lot of our sales, we have a, a few more than, you know, things than, than most companies. So we, we are, we're a Salesforce shop. We use Salesforce. Um, I've been using Salesforce since 2008. So uh, I, I would be lost without it. <laughs> and so we use that. We use Pardot as a auto, uh, marketing automation system. And then our sales team and SDRs use a product called Groove for their sales automation. Uh, it's very similar to outreach, but it's a, a little more uh, uh, startup or it's kind of uh, disrupting the market a little bit right now. Um, on top of that, we use uh, LinkedIn Sales Navigator as kind of our main uh, finding people tool. And then to find contact info, we, we supplement Sales Navigator with Lead IQ. So, a lot, of, a lot of systems in place. Uh, we use Zoom for, for video conferencing, and then we use Slack for kind of just internal communications. Got it. So a lot, a lot of stuff. <laughs> I assume that right now you're responsible for the data quality within Salesforce. If yes, uh, 
how are you currently managing that? Yeah, I am responsible for that. And it's that's kind of like the the ongoing beast. Data quality within sales is is a tough thing to to maintain. Um, some of the things that we do, I have a lot of automation in place that that will not allow bad data in. So duplicate accounts, leads, uh, missing information on, on records. Uh, we put a lot of uh, validation rules in place to make sure that the sales reps fill out everything that they need to. But we also limit the amount of things that we actually require them to fill out. So uh, we have kind of eight to 10 core pieces of information that we ask the sales team to always keep up to date. Everything else is supplemented from services teams or support teams, everything else. So that way, while the ask is very strict, hey, you know, you have to have this data in and accurate all the time, it's not big. You know, I've seen some instances where the opportunity has 65 fields that have to be filled out in order to close it, and your sales rep's just going to quit. And they're literally, not just on the opportunity, they're just going to leave. It's too hard for them to do their job and keep the data up to date. Mm-hmm. So we kind of have a combination of only the core is is required, but you know we we expect the sales team to keep that up to date, and and then we put validation rules so that it's so personally for me it's not so that I'm emailing them nagging them like hey you got to do this you got to do this you got to do this the system does it for them, and it doesn't come from my email address it comes from like the the workflow email address so they don't get mad at me they just it's part of the system mm-hmm. and so. A little self-serving there, but. <laughs> and what are you currently doing to make your FDRs or the account executives more productive? It's a really good question. It's something that we we look at all the time. Um, and part of it is the tools that we put in place. Uh, I review our tech stack every year. Uh, and we don't make changes every year, but I want to know that we have the best available tools out there so that they don't have to kind of play behind the rest of the team. You know, I want them to have every opportunity to to be successful. And then what I've found is you can, you can train someone and you can push them to work harder and more efficient and everything else. But at the end of the day, it's kind of an internal decision for a lot of these guys to work more efficiently or harder, especially when they're not in the presence of other people. You know, there's nothing stopping my account executives from taking a couple of days off and not doing anything. And that's by design. We trust them. They're 10 plus, 15 year plus year enterprise sales guys. So they don't need to punch a clock. But we've done a lot of, of scrutiny in, in, in the interview process to make sure we have the right people in place. Because we feel like if we have the right people in place, then the operations will flow. Uh, you know, if you're fighting upstream against someone that doesn't want to work, it's a lot easier to go hire and find someone that is willing and mo- motivated and ambitious to work. And so I think that's that's an overlooked part of revenue operations is the people, just the people over process. Um, if I get the right people in place, I need less process to be successful. And that kind of helps both sides. Can you share something that you do in the recruitment process that helps you screen for that kind of work ethic? Yeah. um, So a lot of it, I mean, you got to, you just got to get a, you do enough interviews, you get a feel for it. And, and really, I don't like the typical interview uh, where, you know, what, you know, what's the last book you read and all, all these questions. I'd rather prefer to just have a conversation And the biggest thing that I look for in an interview process and finding the right person is I want to know when they struggled. I want to know, hey, it happens to everybody. If you're telling me you're a sales rep and you've never struggled, you probably never really kind of push yourself to the max. And I want to see how people kind of respond to adversity. You you see that a lot in in like military settings. You want to you want to put someone through adversity. I don't really want to put anyone through adversity. I want that to have already happened. And I just want to see how they react and see if they're going to be honest with their feedback, if they're self-aware. Yeah, I did, I did struggle in this situation and I wasn't able to turn it around, but here's what I've learned from it. Or, hey, yeah, I fought through this and I was able to do this. And if I know someone's been through a battle before, I'm not worried about the battle they're going to face at our company. 
you know, because every, every sales org, you know, there's, there's easy times, there's bad times, you know, and, and I just want to make sure that when they're not at 200% of quota, that they're not going to get too stressed out or too miserable trying to catch up to their quota. And, and that's, that's usually the thing that I try to focus on. Um, because they wouldn't even be in the interview if they weren't successful. So I, I, I trust their success. I want to know more about how they got there, essentially. Got it. And from all of your experience in different companies with sales ops, how, what has sales ops role been in the interview process for salespeople? Like, are you guys doing one whole interview? Do you just observe the process? Because I've had some people come on and say that they actually, they, they don't, really get involved at all than some people have right. responsible for interviewing. Yeah. So I've been lucky enough. Um, a lot of the places I've been, the, the role of sales op is, is, or my role has been kind of intermixed with a, like a leadership role, a sales leadership role. And so I've been at Nuvi, I was very involved. I was kind of the hiring manager over a lot of the sales teams. I would bring in the, the sales team leads and we would, co-interview most people. Uh, at Lingo Tech, uh, we have sales leadership in place that is ultimately the, the people that are hiring, but with processes and I'm the one that's going to onboard them and train them and do everything. <clears throat> I'm involved in that process quite a bit. Uh, we do a lot less hiring at Lingo Tech, and so we're a lot more thorough and they'll meet you know six or seven people on the team before we actually extend an offer. And so it's a lot more of a committee decision than it is like a, you know, a VP of sales saying, Hey, this is my guy. And, and then all of a sudden everybody else gets to meet him on the first day. So it's, it's a lot more involved process. And I think that's good because I can give someone insight on how well I think they can adapt to our system because we want them to sell within our system. We don't want, you know, this rogue sales rep that's, you know, just going crazy discounting all over the place and, and, doing stuff that is just going to be a headache for everybody else on the team. Um, so, so you get a, a few different perspectives and I think that's healthy uh, to get kind of a, a full circle perspective on a recruit. Got it. Um, can you share your involvement in the sales forecasting process? Are you responsible for presenting the forecast to the VP of sales? Yeah. So, so the way that we do it at Lingo Tech is we have weekly regional calls uh, for the sales team. So every region has a, a quick call where we go through pipeline every week and we dig in a little bit deeper onto like specific deals. And that is the, the VP of sales and myself and then the, the sales team. So everyone from SDR to sales engineer uh, that's involved in that. So we do the deep dive. It usually takes 30 minutes, uh, you know, every week. And then I run a forecasting call the next day. So then every, all the regions come together and we do a quick, almost like hold yourself accountable forecast. I already know what it is because we had the, the deep dive call. And so within Salesforce, we do all of our forecasting with custom objects that I've created. And we do uh, three forecasts. We, we have an automated forecast from Salesforce that takes our historic close rates on certain stages and provides a probability. So it looks at pipeline and says, okay, there's you know $10 million in our pipeline for this quarter based on our probability index, uh, we're gonna close you know, 4.5 million. And it'll break it down based on how progressed that is and it gives it a higher weighted percentage the further it goes in the pipeline. Then uh, the sales regions have a chance to actually call a manual forecast. So they can say, hey, I know I've got, you know, $2 million in, in best case in my pipeline, but I figure only about 1 million of that is going to close. So my forecast is, is this for the quarter. And then they have an upside forecast. You know, if everything goes great, this is where we're going to land. And then we have quotas tied into Salesforce. It'll do all the calculations and we have a dashboard that basically just shows them, okay, here's where we're at to date. Then here's what the automated forecast says. Here's what your manual forecast says. Here's our best case. And here's how far off of our, our company quota, all of those added up commitments get us. So I can say based on your manual commit, we're you know, $500,000 off the quarter quota. So we've got to go find 
$500,000 more of business right now that we don't have sight on. Uh, so I run that entire process and kind of make sure everything's working smoothly. And then that report gets auto emailed out every week to, to our executive team and our department heads. So everybody knows kind of where we're trending. Got it. Um, and what would you say has been the most valuable sales related KPI in your career in management and operations? Ooh, that's a, that's a tough question. So um, as far as like overall data that I'm looking at to see if a, a sales rep or a region is healthy, um, I, I want to look at two things is one is the frequency of closes and then two, the average deal size. And there's a lot of metrics that can come into play to get to those things. But I know if, if a sales rep is closing on a consistent frequency, <clears throat> then they know how to win. Um, you know, if the average deal size is too small, that's something that we can talk about. Uh, but I don't need to give a closing training to someone who knows how to close. I maybe need to give a negotiation and a pricing training to them to get their average deal size up and vice versa. You know, if someone's got a, you know, a $200,000 average deal size, which our average deal size is about 75,000. Um, annually. So if they're way above that, but they're only closing, you know, two deals a quarter, three deals a quarter, then we start to talk about urgency and, and frequency and how are we setting up the close rather than, hey, you need to go get better deals. Uh, and so I think that's a that's something that I really focus on. Again, it's a people over process. I, I don't want to just give a blanket process to everyone on the team. I'm actually looking at, you know, these metrics and deciding what type of professional development is, is required here so that I don't put someone in front of a boring training that they're already pretty good at. I, I kind of specialize that training for the specific need of the sales rep. And I think that goes a long way with just trust with the sales rep because, you know, they can identify, again, it's that self-awareness they can identify like, hey, I'm, I'm closing, I'm doing pretty good. So I don't want to get harped on for closing business. I just need to figure out how to get better deals. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Let's figure that out. So that those two things are, are where I, I kind of hang my hat on as far as is a sales rep going to make it is can we get a good frequency of deals? And can we get a decent average deal size? And those will fluctuate sometimes. But as long as we know you know, that those two things are in place, then the sales rep will, they'll write the ship or they'll, you know, most of the time, if both of them are in place, they're, you know, crushing their quota. So. Got it. And final question is who has taught you the most in sales operations? That's <clears throat> so coming into this, I, you know, I thought about, I thought about that and kind of how I got started. And so I, I mentioned earlier at Qualtrics, uh, you know, our, uh, VP of sales operations, VP of marketing, whatever, you know, he carried many titles. His name was Austin Bankhead. And he, he had a passion for process and that's kind of carried over to me. And I, I really enjoyed being kind of like his guinea pig and testing all of it. And, you know, I, I honestly probably haven't even thanked him for that. Um, you know, I, I left the company. He's, he's no longer at the company and we, you know, we've kind of, move our separate ways. And, but that really instilled in me, like the fact that sales wasn't just like this, you know, put it in the air. And, you know, if you're really good, smooth talker, you're going to be the best sales rep. It was, there was a system in place. It was scientific at that point. And I, I love that, that type of methodology is just that there's something you can change. There's levers you can pull. There's, you can make people better. It's not just you're born to sell or you're not. And that's where I got from him. And then uh, at Nuvi, our CEO, his name was Cameron Jensen. And so he was a sales rep. He was an amazing sales rep. He did really good. But the thing that I learned from him was how to, the, the people over process. Uh, everybody has something that they want in life. Everybody has something they want out of a job. And your job is to figure that out. And if you can provide people with a desired goal that they have, they're more likely to help you with your desired goal. And so as we go into systems and as I build things for any company that I'm at, 
the goal is not really to build this process. The goal is to help the people that the process uh, runs for. And if you can keep the people in mind over the process, then you're usually going to build the right stuff. Uh, you, you're usually not building something just to build it. And it's usually something that's really inherently valuable for the, those people. And, and Cameron was a behavior, you know, behavioral management major, you know, I mean, just all about getting into the psychology of what makes people decide to do things and, you know, how to influence someone without manipulating them and, and to really understand what makes them tick. And, and so those two kind of yin yang processes, you know, the love of the process, but also the love of the people to to the, the influence that process have influenced me to kind of develop the strategy and the operations that I use today. Well, thanks to Austin and Cameron. Um, yeah. Let me just share a few things that I enjoyed here. So if I can imagine this is a massive challenge being able to influence and build relationships with remote salespeople and your point about trust and over communication, I think was a really really good answer um i actually so the the point you were making about you don't need a super awesome process if you have really good people and the whole point about people over process i thought was really really good so being able to trust in reps because you scrutinize so hard in the recruitment process we, we no one's ever talked about that before so i think that was really really good um and how that six to seven people in the organization in your current organization will meet with somebody before joining I think is a really, really great lesson. Um, and then finally, your two metrics, I think those two are really simple ways of A, understanding how reps are performing, but also then spotting opportunities for training and improvement. Um, so there are things I enjoyed. And we do actually have a question on the side. Um, okay. What, okay, now I'm not sure if I'm going to, I'm not sure if I understand this question. Um, what is the main difference, I think, between outbound and inbound calling? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we, we definitely separate them out, outbound sales strategy and inbound. Uh, and we, when we developed, when I got to Lingo Tech, we developed, a, we call it a sales enablement playbook. And it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, for every sales situation that they get in with every different type of uh, ideal customer profile. So we have an inbound process, uh, the, you know, inbound, someone's interested already. And so we, we are a lot more interested in, in why they're interested. And we ask a lot of questions and we basically try to figure out, okay, why, why did you come to us? And then, you know, for my SDRs, the, the thing that I teach them is, their goal, they're in sales, they're selling time though. You know, so with an inbound, you know, someone's raising their hand and saying, I want to give you my time. Um, but we can't just brush it away. There's a lot of value in that first conversation because they're excited about it. And the customer is saying, okay, like I'm really interested. So our, our SDRs will treat that as, as almost just a discovery. Okay, why are you interested? Find out everything and then set them up for a, a meeting with an AE. Um, once they've qualified it. Um, but we always want to give an inbound lead a chance to qualify themselves. You know, if, if they've, if they've got interest and budget and, uh, and everything, we'll give them a meeting because we often find that the AEs we have can uncover three or four other revenue, uh, verticals that that person wasn't thinking about when they requested a, a demo. So, so our SDRs will work really hard on an inbound lead to gather information and set up a meeting. Uh, outbound is a little, a little more complicated. It's a longer process. The first thing that we're doing with outbound is we're trying to establish credibility. And you don't do that by selling. You, know, you establish credibility by providing value. So our outbound methodology is like, hey, we deal a lot in this industry. Here's some of the things we've learned over the last month, some of the trends. Uh, here's some of the people we work with. Uh, we'd love to, you know, continue to, to provide this information for you. And, and we may not ask for a meeting for maybe two or three points of contact, whether it's a LinkedIn touch or 
an email, a phone call, things like that. We just want to get them into a conversation. And then once we know that it's a right fit, that's when the SDR will come in with a, a meeting request is, okay, it, 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 we sa- it sounds like it makes sense. But uh, the big thing that I come back to is it's all conversational. You know, the way to take the, the griminess of sales out is to just make it a conversation. You know, if you were having the same conversation with your buddy, you know, and you didn't really understand if he was a good fit or not, would you ask him to meet with one of your sales reps? Probably not. So have a conversation, get to know them, let them get to know you. And when you make that ask, they're a lot more likely to say yes. And they're a lot more likely to actually come prepared to, to the meeting because they trust the, the process and the company. Got it. Greg, thank you so much for that bonus question. Um, and thanks so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Many insights. Um, thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thanks, Tom.